News of the Times Twisted Tuesdays From Pulpit to Gallows Rogue Reverends Welcome to News of the Times and this week's episode of Twisted Tuesdays Stories of Reverends Whose Reverence Slipped In today's episode we look at three reverends from history whose lapse in their spiritual leanings led them to swing on the gallows. The Reverend Thomas Hunter, the discovery of his illicit affair had dire consequences to the children under his care. The Reverend William Dodd, noted clergyman of his time, whose expensive lifestyle required additional funding. And lay minister Michael Whiting, whose desire for additional property and prosperity led him to attempt to kill family in order to inherit. We hope you enjoy the show. The Reverend Thomas Hunter, 1700. We start our look at rogue reverends with the Reverend Thomas Hunter, who had illicit relations with a young girl, then murdered two children who had told on him. The Reverend Thomas Hunter executed on the 22nd of August, 1700, near Edinburgh. This story comes from the Newgate Calendar. With profound sorrow, we find ourselves compelled to present to the reader a heinous murder, a character that should have been regarded as the epitome of sanctity Never before has history been stained by a crime so calculated and cruel. Throughout time, ambition has driven tyrants to spill innocent blood. Revenge has spurred men to kill their fellow men. Jealousy, with its distorted vision, has destroyed the objects of its affection. But may the heavens forbid that we should ever again bear witness to a tutor, a minister of the gospel, deliberately taking the lives of his own pupils, the sons of his benefactor. To compound the horror, this wretched sinner expounded his offence by openly proclaiming himself an atheist, thus plumbing the depths of human depravity. This loathsome culprit was born in the county of Fife in Scotland and hailed from a prosperous farming family. His father, recognising his potential, sent him to the venerable University of St Andrews for his education. There he honed his mastery of the classics and eventually earned the coveted title of Master of Arts, embarking upon the study of divinity with considerable success. In the ranks of the clergy, it is not uncommon for young ministers to assume the role of tutors in affluent and esteemed households until the opportune moment arrives for them to take holy orders, an event that typically coincides with the acquisition of a benefice. During this phase they are commonly referred to as chaplains. Such was the case for a certain individual named Hunter, who, for approximately two years, served as a chaplain in the household of Mr. Gordon, a renowned merchant an esteemed Bailey of Edinburgh, a position akin to that of an alderman in London. The household of Mr. Gordon was composed of various members, including the distinguished gentleman himself, his lady, their two sons, a daughter, and a young woman attending to Mrs. Gordon and her daughter, the aforementioned culprit, as well as several clerks and domestic servants. Hunter's primary responsibility was the education of Mr. Gordon's two sons, 
a duty he discharged to the utmost satisfaction of the parents, who regarded him as a youth of exceptional intellect and admirable character. Alas, a connection developed between Hunter and the young woman, which swiftly escalated to a morally reprehensible degree, persisting for a substantial period unbeknownst to the household. One fateful day, while Mr. and Mrs. Gordon were away on a visit, Hunter and his paramour rendezvoused in their private chamber, as was their custom. Regrettably, their lack of caution in securing the door proved to be their downfall. As the children inadvertently entered the room, bearing witness to a scene that left no room for doubt regarding the nature of their illicit liaison. Unbeknownst to anyone, the children harboured no intention of divulging the events they had witnessed to their unsuspecting parents. The eldest boy, not yet ten years of age, joined his siblings for supper that evening, and in their innocent candour they revealed all that had transpired, leaving no room for doubt regarding the gravity of the situation. Consequently, it was decided that the female servant involved would be dismissed from the household the following day. Hunter, however, managed to retain his position within the family's employ. In order to seek redemption for his transgressions, he humbly apologised, attributing his crime to the recklessness of youth and pledging never to offend in a similar manner again. From that moment onward, O oh, profound and lasting hatred festered within Hunter's heart towards the innocent children. He resolved in his diabolical mind to exact the most sinister vengeance upon them, sparing no thought for anything else than their murder. Yet considerable time would pass before he could seize the opportune moment to carry out this abominable plan. On pleasant days it was customary for Hunter to lead his young charges on an hour-long walk through the fields before the midday meal, often accompanied by the young lady. These excursions provided the ideal setting for his sinister designs to take shape. These excursions provided the ideal setting for his sinister designs to take shape. The events leading up to the commission of the heinous act unfolded when Mr. Gordon and his family sought respite at their country retreat, located in close proximity to Edinburgh. The family received an invitation to dine in the city, prompting Mr. and Mrs. Gordon to make plans to leave around the same time that Hunter typically embarked on his midday walk with the children. Mrs. Gordon, eager for all the children to accompany him on the visit, ardently advocated for their presence. However, her husband vehemently opposed the idea, relenting only to allow the little girl to accompany them on their excursion. Due to this unforeseen circumstance, Hunter's plan to murder all three children was foiled. Nevertheless, he remained steadfast in his resolve to extinguish the lives of the boys while they remained within his grasp. To carry out his sinister intentions, Hunter led the children to a serene spot in the fields where he seemingly intended to rest upon the grass. This event unfolded in the latter half of August in the year 1700. Unbeknownst to the unsuspecting children, Hunter secretly readied his knife, poised to terminate their lives while they innocently engaged in the pursuit of catching butterflies and gathering wildflowers. Having sharpened his blade, Hunter called the boys to his side, reproaching them for disclosing 
the disturbing scene they had witnessed to their parents. He then coldly declared his intent to execute them without delay. Overwhelmed with terror, the children fled from him, desperately attempting to escape his clutches. However, Hunter pursued and recaptured them, mercilessly subjecting them to his vile intentions. Pinning down one child, he proceeded to slit the throat of the other with his penknife, repeating the same inhuman act upon the second boy. These horrifying murders were committed within a half a mile radius of the renowned Edinburgh Castle, giving the brazen nature of the crime perpetrated in broad daylight amidst the open fields, it was scarcely conceivable that the murderer would evade immediate apprehension. At that precise moment, a gentleman strolling upon the Castle Hill of Edinburgh caught sight of the gruesome scene. Alarmed by the unfolding tragedy, he swiftly summoned others to join him, hastening towards the lifeless bodies of the children. Meanwhile, Hunter headed towards a nearby river, contemplating his own demise through drowning. However, those in pursuit closed in just as he neared the river's edge. Recognising his identity, they hastily dispatched a messenger to Mr. and Mrs. Gordon, who were on the verge of attending a dinner engagement with a friend, to apprise them of the unspeakable murder of their beloved sons. Words fall short in capturing the profound impact wrought by the transmission of this ghastly news. The afflicted father's sense of bewilderment and the frenzied anguish of the bereaved mother may be grasped to some extent, even if their depths defy adequate portrayal. According to an ancient Scottish law, it was decreed that if a murderer should be apprehended with the victim's blood upon their garments, they shall be prosecuted in the sheriff's court and executed within three days of the commission of the crime. Whilst it was not customary to enforce this sentence with absolute severity, the heinous nature of this offender's deeds left no room for clemency. The utmost rigour of the law was deemed necessary in this case. Consequently, the prisoner was confined to jail, securely chained to the floor throughout the night. The following day, the sheriff issued his order for the convening of the jury. As a result of their verdict, Hunter stood before the court for his trial, wherein he pled guilty. Shockingly, he compounded his heinous offence by proclaiming his regret for not having murdered Mr. Gordon's daughter alongside his sons, further staining his already blackened soul. In light of this damning confession, the sheriff proceeded to pass sentence upon the convict. The judgment pronounced that the ensuing day would witness his execution upon a gibbet erected at the very site where the murders were committed. But prior to this ultimate fate, his right hand would be severed with a hatchet just above the wrist. Then, by means of a rope, he would be hoisted up onto the gibbet, where, upon his death, his lifeless form would be left hanging in chains between Edinburgh and Leith. The knife, the instrument of his wicked deeds, would be impaled through his hand, which would be extended above his head, fixed to the apex of the gibbet. Accordingly, on the 22nd of August, in the year 1700, Mr. Hunter met his fate in strict accordance with the aforementioned sentence. Soon thereafter, however, Mr. Gordon approached the sheriff with a petition requesting the relocation of the body to a more secluded site. The sight of the lifeless form hanging along the highway, a route frequently traversed by Mr. Gordon, served 
as a painful reminder of the tragedy that had befallen him. The sheriff promptly acceded to this plea, and within a few days the body was removed to the outskirts of a small village near Edinburgh named Broughton. It is both dreadful and undeniable that, in the moments preceding his execution, Hunter uttered a profoundly shocking declaration. With his life drawing to a close, he defiantly proclaimed, There is no God. I do not believe there is any, or if there is, I hold him in defiance. To think that this ungodly individual had the audacity to claim himself a minister of the gospel is a truth as disturbing as it is abhorrent. The Reverend William Dodd From the unrepentant illicit relations and multiple child murdering reverend, we now jump to something slightly tamer. The Peacock money-spending, attempted swindler and forger reverend of the mid-eighteenth century who was a chaplain to King George the Third, Forgery at this time was considered a capital offence on a par with murder. The famous and much-respected Reverend Dodd must indeed have been under considerable financial pressure to commit the acts which ultimately led to to his execution. From the Newgate calendar, William Dodd, 1729 to 1777, hung at Tyburn. Born into a religious and respectable family, Dodd was an academic with a talent with words and a reputation for charm and persuasiveness. He also habitually was known as a man who liked the finer things in life. Dodd's insistence of living the good life, whenever he could afford to or not, meant that he struggled continuously to live within his means. In 1751, he married a servant girl, Mary Perkins, who certainly would have impaired his rise in status, at least initially, and would have dramatically impaired his finances. He was mingling with the lower classes by marrying her. The marriage was whispered about for years to come. His father, in trying to redirect Dodd, urged him to follow the religious path, advice with some strong arming that Dodd followed. Dodd was ordained as a priest in 1753 and became a curate in West Ham. Energetic and charming, Dodd steadily moved up the ecclesiastical ranks until, in 1763, he was appointed as the chaplain ordinary to King George III. In this elevated position, he was able to take on a number of higher social class students who had the money to pay exorbitant fees. His fortunes continued to rise as he became chaplain to the king himself and received his Doctor of Laws from Cambridge University. Throughout this time, Dodd continued to spend well above his means. The appellation of the Macaroni Parson followed him as he was renowned for his extravagant and expensive clothing. His free spending and ornate dress aside, Dodd was a well respected and also known for his charitable work. Some of the charitable work that William Dodd established the Magdalen, Home for Unmarried Mothers. Its ethos was to reclaim women who had swerved from the path of virtue. The Society for the Relief of Poor Debtors and the Humane Society, to help in the recovery of those who had apparently drowned. Scandal number one, the bribe. Always in need of additional funds, 
and looking to improve his social and economic position, he attempted to bribe Lady Apsley, the wife of the Lord Chancellor, to help him gain the more lucrative post of Rector of St George's in prestigious Hanover Square. The bribe amount was £3,000, the equivalent to almost half a million pounds in today's money. The bribe attempt was uncovered from Lady Apsley herself, with the letters from Dodd revealing all. The scandal rocked society, and Dodd was the subject of gossip in society and the butt of many a joke. Dodd was dismissed from his post. Making a hasty retreat, Dodd quickly left England for the less scandalous pastures of France and Geneva, where he stayed for two years before finally returning to England in 1776. Scandal 2. The Forgery Still weighted down by heavy debts from his continued luxurious lifestyle, Dodd forged a bond in the name of his old student, the Earl of Chesterfield, for £4,200, worth approximately £900,000 in 2023. The banks initially accepted the bond and lent Dodd money on the basis of it. Dodd's forgery was discovered by the Earl of Chesterfield and then relayed to the bank. The Earl of Chesterfield disowned the bond, leaving Dodd now culpable for forgery, a crime that was treated as a capital offence in Regency days. Dodd begged for time to repay the full amount back, but this was rejected. Dodd was arrested, tried, and found guilty with an overwhelming evidence against him. Dodd was popular both with the common fold and many of his peers. He had been a prolific writer, voicing a compassionate approach to justice and law. However, attempts by the public and friends to have his sentence overturned were unsuccessful. Dodd was to hang on the 27th of June, 1777. Resurrection it had been known for people to survive hanging if they could be treated early enough, as the hanging during this time involved slow strangulation, rather than the broken neck of later executions. Money was duly paid to the executioner, requesting that he stop the body from swaying and cut his body down relatively quickly. Friends were at the ready to work on resuscitating Dodd once they recovered his body. However, similar to Jack Shepard's plan to cheat the executioner that we covered in our episode on escaped prisoners, Dodd's fans did not know the plan. Dodd's death coach was mobbed by thousands of fans once he had been cut down, thereby delaying any kind of medical treatment for over two hours. Survival? The news report stated that Dodd had been buried at Cowley in Middlesex, yet there is no recording of his burial having taken place there. For years to come, friends who had known him claimed to have seen him in France and Scotland. Did he manage to escape an executioner's death? It remains a mystery. We end this episode of Rogue Reverends with the story of Michael Whiting, a lay preacher who also worked as a flower supplier, living next door to his two brothers-in-law. Whiting comes up with a plan to take over their property. From the Newgate Calendar, Michael Whiting executed on the 19th of March, 1812. Michael Whiting, Methodist preacher sentenced to death for poisoning his two brothers-in-law with an intent to possess himself of their property in 1811. On the fateful morning of Tuesday the 12th of March 1811, an ominous sequence of events unfolded, forever altering the lives 
of those involved. The Langman siblings dispatched their sister to the dwelling of the accused in order to borrow a loaf of bread. Unbeknownst to them, this seemingly mundane errand would set in motion a chain of events that would lead to tragedy. The prisoner, accompanied by their sister, returned to the Langman's residence, bearing not only the requested loaf, but also a promise to provide flour and pork for a delectable pudding to grace their dinner table. With these provisions in hand, the accused departed, only to reappear shortly thereafter with the basin brewing with flour and pork. Directing his words to the housekeeper, the prisoner remarked, Catherine, be sure you make the boys a pudding before you go. Following this peculiar instruction, he whisked away the youngest child, bringing him to his own abode for their shared midday repast. Meanwhile, the housekeeper diligently set to work, preparing two puddings. However, she noted with perplexity that the flour failed to bind as expected, leaving the puddings in a kneading trough. She proceeded to boil one of them for the anticipated meal. The ill-fated diners had scarcely consumed a few mouthfuls before an overpowering sickness gripped them, inducing violent vomiting. A grave suspicion arose that the pudding had been poisoned. In an attempt to confirm their suspicions, one of the Langmans offered a small piece to a sow in their yard, which swiftly devoured it, only to succumb to illness and, after a lingering struggle, to meet its demise. While the elder brother managed to recover from the ordeal, the younger sibling languished in a precarious state for several agonizing days. Subsequent analysis by Mr. Wollaston, a distinguished professor of chemistry at the University of Cambridge, revealed that the remnants of the pudding contained a significant quantity of a corrosive subliminate of mercury, a deadly poison. The accused who, it transpired, dealt in flour, made a feeble attempt to explain the poisoning by claiming that he had recently employed nux vomica to eradicate vermin, suggesting that traces of it might have inadvertently found their way into his flour bin. However, Mr. Wollaston vehemently asserted that the pudding contained no other poisonous substance except corrosive sublimate. Furthermore, evidence surfaced indicating that the prisoner, who traded in drugs, had acquired a substantial quantity of that very poison from his predecessor in the business. It also came to light that upon learning of the Langman's poisoning, the accused hastily emptied and washed out his flour bins. Representing the prisoner's defence, Mr. Alley, hailing from London, made his case before the court. The trial, an arduous affair, endured until six o'clock in the evening. Following a mere, a mere ten minutes of deliberation, the jury returned a verdict of guilty. Without delay, the judge pronounced the sentence of death, leaving the prisoner to face the gallows as the final chapter in this tragic tale. That concludes this episode of Twisted Tuesdays, from pulpit to gallows, rogue reverence. We really hope you enjoyed the episode. We would like to thank our tremendous supportive subscribers. Thank you. Your comments, suggestions and interaction is greatly appreciated. Thank you again. If you haven't subscribed, we would be very grateful if you did. We need a minimum of 1,000 subscribers to keep this channel alive. Please subscribe, tell your friends and share on social media. We would greatly appreciate it. 
we upload six days a week. Fridays are a new limited series called Forgotten Fridays, where we explore a snapshot from newspaper articles, advertisements and publications of a time from long ago. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrageous organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times and I am Robin Coles.